All right, we are all set, Alex. Thank you so much. I, um, as I, I was saying a second ago, um, I'm very excited to be here today to talk with you um, about Oscar. This session is the first in a series of uh, webinars on Oscar, and this one uh, in particular is um, focused on the Oscar self-assessment rubric. Um, so if you teach an online course and are interested in improving that online course, uh, the self-assessment Oscar rubric is a way that you can use a set of um, research-based standards to reflect on your course and to use the tools and the materials related to Oscar and think about what you would like to improve in your course for the next time you teach it. I assume that there are a variety of folks in the room. Some may be uh, faculty, some may be new to Oscar, some may have used Oscar in the past, some may be instructional designers. And what one of the exciting things this semester that we're doing is this series that really is um, focused on promoting um, the Oscar trainings that we have. We've always offered these trainings and sometimes we've done them in these lunchtime webinar events, but um, but this semester we are, and you, any institution from SUNY is always able to contact us and and have us do these, uh, these webinars for their faculty as part of their online quality activities. Um, this is part of our SLA and they're available to any SUNY um, campus for at no cost. So all of these uh, Oscar related uh, webinars and certifications are free of any cost to SUNY. And, um, and so this semester, we're putting them together in a package and offering them, um, you know, more um, broadly and more specifically, I guess, in, as a, as this package of uh, the series of, of webinars. And I know there must be um, instructional designers out there um, that are SUNY instructional designers that qualify for several of our certifications, but that they may not have them. And so I really want to encourage you, um, whether you're SUNY or not, to uh, pursue the certification so that you can have that credential. I love to give out badges, and I would love to give you the Oscar badges for all of the work that you um, have done over the years to recognize that and to give you that um, that credential um, for uh, you know for your portfolio. Um, and and it's also available to all of these um, webinars and certifications are available to anyone regardless of whether whether they're um, SUNY or not. There's a small fee for the certification because I have to review your evidence. And, and if you're SUNY, I do that because you're SUNY. And if you're not SUNY, I uh, need to charge a very modest, I think it's $50 per, per certification um, fee. So I am really um, happy to be here and to see so many of you here um, with us. Uh, Aaron introduced me, and you may we may know each other. I'm Alexandra Pickett, the director of online teaching. I have a cold, so sorry about that. I sound a little funny. Um, I like to think of myself as Oscar's mom, and um, I was the first SUNY instructional online instructional designer. Um, they tell me that I've been here for 30 years. Uh, this is my 30th year at SUNY, and so in 1994, there were no there was no online education um, at SUNY in the way that we know it today. There were certain things going on, but not, not like today. And so I was the first online ID working with faculty and developing, under, trying to understand what they were trying to do and developing online courses. I've trained thousands of online faculty over the those years, uh, hundreds of online instructional designers. I think we now have at least one instructional designer at every SUNY institution. I, be, I believe that's true. Um, I'm an instructor, uh, adjunct online instructor at the University of Albany um, and have taught in the um, uh, education theory and practice department um, for, I taught there for many years. Um, I'm taking a break right now because I'm working on my PhD and I am about to finish either this semester or next semester. 
Um, I'm a Middle States peer reviewer. I'm also a Educause Horizon report um, uh, expert panelist. And, um, and so I know a little bit about online teaching kind of just because I've been around for a long time and have worked Worked, had the privilege of working with um, so many faculty, instructional designers, and, and folks who are part of our community of online practitioners, both internal to SUNY as well as external. Um, so the first thing I'm going to tell you is that all of the stuff I'm going to show you today is um, in this under this link. And th this link is a, um, a folder, a, a Google folder of resources of everything I'm gonna show you. And there's one page within that folder, including this presentation, but there's one page within that folder that has, um, why is this not working? There we go. Uh, this page here, it lives in that folder and you can see it's like chock-a-block full of links. So all of these links, and you can also see my, um, my browser window. So all of those links are here on this page. So you don't need to worry about trying to screen capture or find the links or whatever. They're all here for in a in a handy dandy uh, Google Doc for you to take a look at after the session or to follow along while we're doing the session. Um, so, oh, somehow we went to another page. So um, I wanted to mention, let me just see where I am here. Um, the agenda for today, we're gonna do an overview um, to the self-assessment rubric and talk about how to apply the standards. I'm gonna give you an overview of the OSCAR tools and resources to support um, online continuous improvement of the design of an online course. So whether you're an instructional designer or, or a, a faculty member and whether you're new at it or experienced at it, it's always nice to who have um, these tools and this rubric to refer to and to know what's there so that you can um, work on improving the design of your online course. We're gonna go through how to access the rubric and um, some of the different forms of the rubric. There's a, a PDF version and there's an online more interactive version. You're also gonna get a, um, a chance to earn some badges um, at, for your participation in this um, webinar and for uh, just being who you are, <laughs> we can recognize you as a friend of, of um, SUNY online. And also if you are part of SUNY, you would um, qualify for the experienced online practitioner role. Um, and you'll get those automatically. You don't have to sign up for that. Or, um, we know who you are based on your registration and your participation in this webinar. So you'll be able to get those um, automatically without taking any further action. It might take Aaron and I a couple of days to go through the uh, Zoom um, and pull out the names and uh, really um, we're looking for first name and last name and email address. So, um, <laughs> And we'll get that from your either your registration or from where you are right now within the Zoom. So it might take us a few days, but you will get um, a number of badges as a result of this. And I'll talk more about the badges um, at the end uh, because this um, this webinar uh, prepares you to do a review and to do a refresh of your own online course. And then once you complete that review, and if you would like the certification, you can provide some evidence and then I'll issue you the certification that you have completed the entire, uh, the entire process. Um, let's see, what else here? Just a little overview for those who may not be familiar with our um, full um, sort of history, I guess, of, of Oscar. We started um, way back in uh, 2013 and it has evolved and uh, been updated over the years. We're currently in version 4.0 and we actually have a version 4.1, which includes 
um, COIL standards for virtual exchange and virtual experiential learning. And I'll show you in a second where you can find information about that. If you are interested in having a virtual exchange, we have some standards um, and they're associated with the Center for Online International Learning. And we're very excited about that. We just won an award for, for incorporating those standards from WCET, which is a national association. And um, we're very excited about, uh, about that recognition for those COIL standards. Um, all right, any questions so far, Erin, in the chat? Nope, it looks good. Okay. So um, please feel free to ask a question in the chat. I'd like to plow through everything and then have a chance at the end to um, focus in on any questions you might have, if that's okay. If you're really, really burning with a question, um, we'll figure out how to accommodate that. Um, but one of the first things that I'd like to do, and you may have seen this video before, but um, there may be folks in the room who haven't, and I like to show it because I think it's good. Um, and also um, because it's a really nice, succinct way to share with folks who may not be familiar with Oscar at your institution, so your colleagues or your department or your um, you know, online education staff. Um, if you, uh, you know, it's a nice way to introduce people in, in kind of a very comprehensive way in this short video um, of what Oscar is about and what it does. So I am going to play it and um, you just, yep. And then we'll continue after the video. SUNY Online has developed an online course design rubric and process that addresses both the instructional design and accessibility of an online course that is openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt. The aim of the SUNY Online Course Quality Review, or OSCAR, rubric and process is to support continuous improvements to the quality and accessibility of online courses, while also providing a systematic approach to collect data across campuses, institutions, departments, and programs. This data can be used to inform faculty development and support large-scale online course design, review, and refresh efforts consistently. There are two components, the OSCAR process and the OSCAR rubric. The OSCAR process provides a framework and a dashboard to support a campus-tailored and scalable approach to improving the instructional design and accessibility of online or blended courses. There are three parts to the process. The online course review, using the OSCAR rubric, yields an action plan that informs the online course refresh process by targeting areas for improvements. After the identified areas have been refreshed and implemented, the learning review closes the continuous improvement loop to confirm the success of the changes made and the development of a plan for the next set of improvements. The dashboard is housed in Google Drive, which allows for free storage and collaboration. It automates campus level review efforts and accommodates customized rubrics by managing all the rubrics for the institution. Built-in analytics track course review progress and can be used to identify online course design trends. Working with multi-institutional teams of SUNY online instructional designers, librarians, distance learning directors, technologists, and accessibility experts, SUNY online staff started with 20 years of SUNY Learning Network research-informed best online practices, the Chico rubric, universal learning design principles, the SUNY Office of General Counsel's Memorandum on Accessibility Considerations, and conducted a gap analysis with Quality Matters, iNicole, and Blackboard Exemplary courses. The resulting 50 standards in the rubric target online instructional design and incorporate the community of inquiry model, the seven principles of good practice in undergraduate education, the adult learner, Bloom's taxonomy, how people learn, and has been mapped to the SUNY Online fundamental and core competencies for online course design. OSCAR is the first online course quality rubric that specifically addresses the U.S. Department of Education regulation requirements for regular and substantive interaction, RSI, 
in the design of online courses. Oscar can be leveraged by faculty, instructional designers, departments, and institutions to assist in planning, designing, improving, documenting, and implementing online courses and programs that are in compliance with RSI regulations. OSCAR standards guide online course design and refresh efforts, as well as faculty development activities to support RSI compliance in new online course development and review of existing online courses. OSCAR standards can be used by online faculty and instructional designers in faculty self-assessments, faculty training activities, resource materials, course reviews, as recommendations and standards to support and document how the online course meets the RSI requirements. The rubric is easy to use, flexible, non-evaluative, requires no storage space, can be customized, and can be implemented in a variety of ways. As part of an online faculty development and online course design professional development process, as an online faculty self-assessment, as part of an online course quality review process by online instructional designers, as a faculty peer review process, in a multidisciplinary collaborative team review model. The rubric also produces an action plan, allows for prioritization of standards, estimates amount of time to make improvements, offers suggestions and examples for improvements, accommodates modification and addition of standards. The 50 Oscar rubric standards also integrate specific ways to make an online course accessible to students with disabilities and specific suggestions for ensuring regular and substantive interaction in online course design. Oscar was adopted by the Online Learning Consortium in 2016 and is featured as the online course quality rubric in their suite of online quality scorecards. The SUNY Online Oscar rubric is flexible, customizable, research-based, openly licensed for anyone to use and adapt, and nationally recognized. It is currently being used by 56 SUNY institutions and thousands of non-SUNY institutions and individuals. For more information on SUNY Online and OSCAR, visit oscar.suny.edu. Get out of this video so it doesn't play anything. Um, the you know one thing that I'd like to make sure to mention, sort of in follow up to the video, um, is that um, Oscar is, is really intended as a um um. It's a tool, it's a framework and it's a tool, as it said in the video, um, but it's really intended to promote continuous improvement, continuous online improvement for um, for online course design. Um, trying to get to my page here. <clears throat> and here it is, here it's coming, it's just taking its time. Um, so this process, um, Oh, it disappeared. Uh, I guess so. the The process is really intent. It's not intended to be a course or a faculty evaluation. Uh, it's really intended to support continuous improvement and the refresh process, and um, and not as a as a course or faculty evaluation. Um, so, it, for example, it's not evaluative. You you can't fail Oscar like you can with some of the other rubrics. Um, here it is. Here's the page. Um, and it's uh, um, some other unique aspects of it that are different from other rubrics are that um, it's extensible. It can accommodate um, additions and editing of standards. Um, elimination of standards. So for example, if you are in a nursing program or a dental assisting program that has accreditation with a national um, organization, you may have some specific standards that you want your online courses in that program to meet. So you can add those standards to the rubric and incorporate them in the review process. Um, 
It's not restricted to mature courses like some courses are. In fact, I recommend that you use it formatively with new online faculty so that they can see and understand what um, the standards are and design their new online courses to those standards from the beginning. Um, um, another unique thing is the action plan that it can assist you to design and that helps with um, making decisions about priorities of what to address. So it's not assumed that if you find a ton of stuff to fix, in the course that you have to fix all of it before you can teach again, teach it again. Um, it's really intended to help you, uh, um, especially the self-assessment rubric, to help you um, understand what you yourself have decided needs improvement. And then to, there's some tools that it, uh, that it helps you with to figure out um, what the priority might be, what your priority might be in terms of addressing those improvements. So um, it's it's aimed at um, at creating an action plan that you can then use um, uh, to target specific things and then to return to the next time you review your course to continuously improve, you know, work on the next set of things that need improvement. Um, it, it targets accessibility and, and uh, regular and substantive interaction, as the video said, um, and it's intended to assist, um, you know, to inform and assist in, in um, meeting compliance in, in both accessibility and um, regular and substantive interaction. Another unique thing about it is that it's openly licensed and free to use. Um, and again, it's it, it, it there's an intentional flexibility uh, designed into it to accommodate uh, various uh, course review uh, and refresh models. So um, this session is about the self-assessment model. So assuming you have a course that you teach and that you want to improve in some way, and this will help you and guide you in uh, reviewing and refreshing your own online course, but that's just one model. There are also uh, models out there where an instructional designer would do a review. There's a formally or informally, there might be a model where um, there are peers in your discipline and department or cross-disciplinary uh, peers that would do peer review each other's courses. Um, and then there's multidisciplinary teams, for example, you might have a student, a librarian, a subject matter expert, and an instructional designer review courses for, and you might have intentional things that you're trying to target, like improving engagement and interaction, improving RSI, improving accessibility. So there might be targeted um, aspects for your um, review and refresh process. So there, so Oscar is intended to be able to accommodate whatever you're trying to do regarding the review and improvement of an online of an online course. Um, all right, so let me give you a tour of uh, of the website so that you can see the tools and the resources that are available. The way the site is organized and it's oscar.suny.edu and I'm sure um, Aaron will be posting links as I go along in the chat. But if you go to that site, you'll see, well, first there's the about Oscar and how Oscar is unique. And that video is under here somewhere. And so if you're, if you're trying to explain it to somebody, there's a bunch of stuff here under about that will help you do that. <laughs> um, you can see that Oscar is uh, the the standards of the rubric are divided into six categories. Um, course overview and information is about ten standards. The technology and tools is about five, and so forth. Design and layout, um, content and activities, interaction, assessment and feedback. So the, these are the categories of the standards that uh, comprise Oscar, and then. Each um, uh, each standard uh, is organized similarly. So you'll see the you know the substance of the standard. This is the first one, and it's um, uh, it, the the actual standard is course includes 
a welcome and, a, and getting started information for the course. And you'll see there's a, an explanation of the um, standard. There's a mini learning video um, that is um, put together from interviews that we did with our own faculty and staff over um, over the a, a few a couple of years, uh, and we put these together, having our own SUNY um, instructional designers and faculty talking about each standard and why it's important and how they actually use it or implement it. So every standard has that little micro learning video. If the standard is related in some way to RSI, you'll see a section in the page about RSI. And then all of the standards will have suggestions for how to refresh your course with additional links and resources and, and um, ideas for how you might um, improve your this particular standard, right? So, um, so if you're an instructional design, sorry, if you're a faculty person and you're looking to improve your course and you want to target, you're welcome and you're getting started activities, you might come here for some ideas. And then there are some examples. And one of the things that we recommend, and you may or may not already do this, but a nice video introduction that is, um, you know, extemporaneous. It doesn't have to be a Steven Spielberg quality introduction. It could just be you saying, um, hello and and welcome to the course and your name and some information about you in the course. One of the things I like to recommend in, in terms of, of uh, an opening welcome video is not just doing a, a self-introduction as the instructor, but also providing a tour of your course to help the learners, uh, many of whom may be doing an online course for the first time, get oriented to your learning management system and where to go in your course for different things and what, what areas of the course might be important for them to pay attention to, where the syllabus is, where the course schedule is, where they submit their assignments, how to find the grade book, uh, all of those uh, kinds of things. You could do a very quick tour of your course along with your self-introduction. So, um, so that's just one of the ideas that you could use to improve this particular standard in, um, in your course. Um, let's see what else. Uh, so, so every, every, um, uh, standard has those ideas and examples, additional information. And then if there, we, we have a collaboration with the University of Central Florida and their uh, topper repository that's teaching online pedagogical repository. And so that's an, also a really good resource. And I'll show you some additional links to this in a minute. But this is a really great, if you're looking for ideas, this is a great resource to mine for ideas on how how to improve certain things. And we've tried to incorporate some direct links from within the Oscar pages to those topper um, uh, resources. So look for those. And then we always have some additional resources to explore. If you're interested in this particular topic, you can always learn more and always improve everything in your, and you can always do, you know, make some improvements. And um, we'll have citations to, to paper that support, um, you know, scholarly work that supports the particular standard if you're interested in that as well. And then we also have a place where you can um, ask a question or uh, comment or contribute your own ideas that might eventually make their way into this website for additional ideas, um, uh, you know, in how, to, in how to improve on this particular standard. So every page has all of those elements. Um, I'm going to go over the Get Oscar page in a minute, but I did mention RSI, and I'm going to go over that in a minute too. But there's a section on RSI, the standards that are associated with RSI, how Oscar supports RSI, what's new, and then some references and resources related to that. I had mentioned COIL and um, the COIL standards. There's four of them, and these are to support virtual um, exchange activities and international experiential learning 
activities and those standards are around intercultural communication, cultural awareness, collaboration, and team working skills. These are these are competencies that learners would be um, developing in their um, engagement in COIL activities. And I want to also point out the fact that all of these COIL pages have been uh, translated into Spanish, and we also have the COIL rubric, uh, the COIL plus Oscar rubric, the entire rubric in Spanish, and and uh, the the COIL standards also. So I'll show you that in a second when I go to the Get Oscar page. Um, we've not won a number of awards for this. There have been over the years. We just won another one in 2024. I haven't had a chance to put it up yet, but um, we won it for the COIL standards. There are a number of people who have been involved in in assisting and supporting the um, development as well as the continuous improvement of COIL. Sorry of Oscar, and I was just reading the COIL page, but those are the folks who were involved in the COIL project, and then a number of folks were involved in the Oscar 4.0 project and so forth. You can see everyone who has been involved, um, and we try, we've try, we tried to keep that up to date and to recognize everyone um, that was involved. Um, so just so that you know, you know, it's not just me and Aaron sitting in our offices or at my kitchen table. Um, uh, developing this stuff, we've worked with a lot of folks uh, over the years. And there's a big community around the development of um, Oscar. And for some reason, this page isn't rendering. Sorry about that. But there are a number of um, um, folks internal as well as external to SUNY that have conducted scholarly work. And on this page typically is a link roll of all of those research articles, both internal and external to SUNY. I'll try and figure out how to fix that um, at some point soon. Um, Cause we want people to know and understand that there is scholarly work behind um, these, this rubric and these standards and every standard is research-based. There are, there, there's a reason why every standard is, is in place. Uh, and <coughs> we also have, uh, um, uh, community activities and, and community developed materials and resources. And so you can come to this page to uh, see some of the materials and resources that our community has developed um, over time. And then of course we have our training um, and certifications um, that are available now. So, um, all right, I think, what I'm going to do now is move on from the tour to get your rubric. Um, and you, I want you to go at some point soon to the, um, to the get your Oscar rubric page. And it's under here, um, one of the breadcrumb trails on the Oscar uh, website. And there's a number of links that you can um, click on depending on what you're looking for. So if you're just just looking for the Oscar, the blank Oscar self-assessment PDF. Um, if you happen to want to see that rubric in Spanish, it's available in Spanish. And we have a number of people all over the world from Spanish speaking countries that are using the Spanish version of the rubric. Um, and we hope to be able to develop um, additional rubrics in, in other languages as well um, as we uh, um, as we continue this work. We also have the COIL rubric in English. Uh, it's the COIL plus Oscar rubric. So it's the full Oscar rubric with the addition of the COIL standards. So um, that's available in English and in Spanish. And then we also have the interactive rubric uh, that was mentioned in the video. And I'm going to show you um, a few of these um, resources now so that you can see. If you want to download it from OLC, you can go to the OLC page and you'll see that um, they allow, you know, they, you can download the scorecard. It's free from OLC. Um, we have a partnership. We have had a partnership with them um, uh, and they offer Oscar as their online quality scorecard. Um, you can get it there, or you could just download it right straight from our website, and this is what it looks like. Um, and you can see it's a fillable PDF. It's been optimized for accessibility, 
um, and it allows you to go in and, and fill it out and type in um, your feedback um, and go through each of the standards in that manner. And every time you look at a standard, you can get additional, like if you can see I'm mousing over this particular standard and this is standard 21. And if I click on it, I would get to standard 21 on the, on the Oscar website so that you can directly from the rubric connect over to the resource that will explain that standard and provide you with ideas on how to improve that standard. So as you're doing your self-assessment, this um, facilitates that work of, of you know, connecting to additional information about the, the particular standard and ideas on how to improve that particular standard. And then um, at the end, there's a larger field that allows you to type in your more global um, impressions or ideas, just so that you don't forget um, things that you want to either ask an instructional designer about or um, or to make sure that you remember to do. So there's an, an, an additional field not associated with any particular standard where you can document your feedback. And you'll note in this, uh, in this rubric, you'll note that the options for um, you know, determining what's going on with a particular standard is that it's sufficiently present. So if you look at, the, let's say, course includes welcome and getting started, and you think it's sufficiently present, you're doing the self-assessment and you're you're self-assessing that it, that the welcome and getting started information is sufficiently present, you just click on that. If you think it needs a minor revision, and by minor we mean it'll take you half an hour or less to do it, uh, then you would select that if you think it's a moderate revision. So it might take between half an hour and two hours to improve. Um, maybe if you want to include a, um, a, a, um, an update video tour of your course, that might take you a couple of hours. Um, and if it's a major revision, so you know if you really need to work on your um, welcome and, and getting started information, you, and that would take you more than two hours, you would select that. And then if it's not applicable for any reason, it's possible that one or more of these standards would not be applicable to you or your course or your, you know, your process here. Uh, so you would select not applicable. And then any comments or um, or ideas or notes that you want to take about how you want to improve this particular standard, you would put in the action plan. So that is the PDF version of the rubric. We also have an online interactive version of the rubric, and you can get to this page off of the Oscar, get Oscar webpage uh, here. Here's the interactive version right here. And if you click on this link, you would get to this form. And all this form is asking you for is your email address and the name of your course. And once you submit that, it will generate for you the interactive rubric and it'll take a little minute for it to do that. Um, there are, is a lot of code behind the interactive versions of the, of the rubric. So it'll take a minute and then you'll get a couple of emails with in, instructions on how to access and, and use the, the interactive version of the rubric. Um, and this is what the interactive version looks like. So it's basically a souped up spreadsheet, Google spreadsheet. And, um, and you'll, you'll see down here along the bottom, right here on this page, it's sort of like a profile of the course that is being reviewed. So it would be your course title. And it what you know, when you fill out the form, you give it a course title. So whatever title you gave it will appear here. Um, there's, you can um, then fill the form out, which is the number of credits. You'll have to do this. It'll come blank. You'll have to fill it out. And, um, and you don't have to, I mean, if you're doing this as a self-assessment, you know, your course, you're not sharing this with anyone. We have this profile because the rubric is intended to be used in a variety of models. So if an instructional designer is doing a whole bunch of courses, they need kind of a, a a, an overview of what the course is. So it's a three credit course. 
Um, I'm using this as a demonstration of apparently of the new RSI Oscar rubric. Um, the current instructor is the developer, it's a fall semester and so forth. So uh, this is all sort of like profile information about the course. And then along the bottom, you can see there's a tab for the instructional designer, a tab for the instructor, a tab for a random reviewer, and then the action plan that we talked about in the uh, video. And so if you fill this out, and I've already pre-populated this, you can see that there's a couple of differences with, from the PDF. So this one, if you mouse over, you have some explanatory information for each of the um, for each of the standards. You can get the same information by actually going to the website. And so the way that you get to the website from this interactive version is by going over to the need ideas section over here, the far right column has the need ideas and every one goes to the appropriate um, standard. So uh, you'll see, you know, this one goes to standard four and on standard five, it goes to standard five and so forth. So you can still get easily to the Oscar website um, from the interactive rubric as well. And then you have this additional mouse over section that gives you some additional information. Um, it also tells you <coughs> that the standard in some way is um, uh, assisting with the regular and sub meeting the, the requirements for regular and substantive interaction. And you can still go in and, you know, mark um, sufficiently present or minor revision. You can add to the action plan notes uh, and so forth. It's very, very similar to the PDF version in how you fill it out. Um, and there's the overall narrative. And then it this action plan is different than the self-assessment PDF um, in that it actually aggregates any information that has been in, entered into the spreadsheet into an action plan. So everything will be added here to this page. So it's all concise. If you're doing it just for yourself, it'll only be your comments in there. Um, if if you're doing it in, with you know a team of people or multiple people reviewing the course, all of the feedback will be aggregated into this page. And so you can see here, the comment was that this could use a video and a course tour. It's gonna take, um, um, whatever this uh, time is um, to fix and that this is considered important as opposed to essential. Um, so we've taken a stance on things that are important versus essential because this is an openly licensed tool. If you disagree with that, you can change that. Um, so you can modify, um, you know, the, the way that it displays what's important and, and what's essential, you can come up with your own uh, priorities. So your nursing courses might have different priorities than your um, English literature courses, for example. So you can modify that if, if you want. Um, and then let me just show you. So it, it I filled it all out from the instructional designer perspective. And then at the end is the, um, the narrative feedback that it pulled in from the instructional designer tab uh, in this particular case. All right, <clears throat> so um, I guess I wanted to also that so that was the get Oscar section um, and and tour of the Oscar website. I wanted to point out um, that we have a number of Oscar informed tools and resources. So. It's, you know, there's not just the rubric and not just the Oscar website, but we have built out a number of, of additional tools and resources that are Oscar informed. So we have a set of eight course templates in uh, Brightspace and also exported a, as an open package. So you could actually import these into any learning management system, not just Brightspace. Um, and it, it's for both credit and non-credit courses. So we have one for face-to-face, -face, we have one for blended learning, we have one for high, uh, for high flex, we have one for synchronous, one for asynchronous, and then a couple of non-credit uh, versions of the template, all Oscar informed. There's guides that go along with those templates. There's an Oscar alignment document that shows how Oscar is aligned with every element that exists in the online asynchronous course. And 
then that applies to all the other courses as well. <clears throat> There's a rationale document. So it explains in more detail why we made the decisions and determinations we did for what to include in the um, course templates uh, based on Oscar. We have a frequently asked questions. We have some videos and tours of courses um, that you can take a look at some of our campuses who have implemented these templates and you can see how they have implemented them in their home campuses and what the templates look like. Um, then there's the information about COIL, the information about um, RSI. We have a, a syllabus that I'll show you in a second and um, community resources and, and uh, tips and, and suggestions. And I'll show you that in a, in a little bit too. All right, so that's basically the tour of Oscar and the tools um, and, and information around Oscar. Um, so now I think what we'll do is dive into um, the discussion of selected standards. So as you know um, from the video, there are 50 and I've handpicked a handful from each category of Oscar standards to go over with you and to talk through some of the important things from the self-assessment perspective that I think uh, uh, would be important for you to think about and consider as you're doing a self-assessment um, and to talk through you know, how you might apply the particular standards. So in the first section, it's course overview and information. So this is all the getting started and the welcome and introductions materials that are in uh, or should be in every online um, course. And I chose, um, uh, standard three, <laughs> and this standard really um, uh, highlights the importance of having a course information area in your online course to help orient the students to the important um, uh, pieces, the important areas of your course, the important information for your course, and a syllabus um, where you might find that same information. Um, and uh, to really help make sure that students are well oriented to your expectations and to how to do things and get to things and, and understand how you've organized your course and what they're supposed to do to make sure that all of that is very findable to them. And um, one of the things that I wanted to show you related to this um, is the syllabus that I mentioned. Uh, I, when we were looking at the tools and resources of Oscar informed um, materials, this is one of them that we've developed. And you can use this as a model um, to check your own syllabus against, or you can just make a copy of this and use this. <laughs> it's, it's a template, so you can just um, file and make a copy. Uh, make a copy, here it is, make a copy, and then it's yours and you can modify it however you like. Um, and you can see that it has um, everywhere uh, where what how it's aligned with Oscar. So every time you see, um, you know, on every line, it, it'll tell you which Oscar standard it aligns with. And so I think it's just important to understand that it's not random that everything that's in your syllabus as well as everything in your course, um, it, it, there's something in Oscar that aligns with it. And so this kind of illustrates that point. Obviously, if you were using this, you'd remove that, um, you know, you'd replace this with your name. And it says there, remove this text to help prompt you to do that. Um, but it has unique things like sharing your names and pronouns and your preferred way that you'd like to be addressed. Um, it has a basic needs statement, which we learned was particularly important and relevant during COVID um, to help make sure that students had what they needed and, uh, you know, in order to be able to um, engage um, uh, appropriately. Um, and a, a statement from the student perspective about how, you know, about names and pronouns. So you share your own and you invite your students to share theirs with you as well and with the rest of the class. Um, there's a section on regular and substantive interaction. And this is a very easy way to demonstrate compliance with this um, regulation if you have it in your syllabus. 
and and document how you are um, in you know um, implementing regular and substantive interaction in your course. You 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 have it in your syllabus, and and that's a piece of evidence that supports um, that you're in compliance with this uh, federal regulation. Um, and I think another important thing in here, you can see it looks like you know most syllabi. Um, Another important thing in here is uh, tips and use of artificial intelligence in your coursework. So it's really important, I think, to consider what your um, position is on the use of artificial intelligence and to let your learners know what that is. And so there, you might not allow it at all. And if that's the case, you would articulate that. Um, so it's clear to them so that they understand your expectations around them, around that. If you, if it's okay in some, um, um, aspects or some assignments, uh, then you would articulate what that is about, under what conditions, and and then you know that kind of thing. And then if you want to encourage it um, throughout the course, then you would articulate the specifics around that as well. And you might also want to help learners understand how to cite um, uh, the use of of. Copilot or ChatGPT or whatever um, AI they might be leveraging in your course for whatever reason. So, um, so you might want to check, um, you know, think about your, you know, whether you have an, uh, a policy at your institution or department. Check with your instructional designers, uh, and then think about your own um, your own stance on this and incorporate that into your uh, syllabus so that students know uh, they won't. No, if you don't tell them. Uh, and then a bunch of things regarding campus policies and processes are often very important for online students in particular. And your institution may do a great job of, um, you know, uh, detailing this for your online students. There may be a whole website for online students that has all of this information readily available all in one place, targeting your online um, learner populations in the various programs your department might have one. It might be institutional, it might be departmental, it might be at the program level, but some institutions don't have that yet. And so if that's the case, you wanna make sure to include all of this information in your syllabus and in your course in some way so that your online students are easily able to find this information um, without having to, uh, you know, take Herculean measures in order to find what it is that they're looking for, for any of these um, uh, campus policies and processes. The one that we found doing focus groups with students that was the most important um, was withdrawal and drop date policy. And there was another one, uh, I'm trying to think. I think that was it. I think that was the main one. They were really wanting to know, you know, how do they, um, what are the procedures? Uh, oh, and also the, the grievances and appeals, those two things they thought students that we asked thought were particularly important and they had often difficulty finding that information that was specific to them as online learners. Um, all right, the next thing I wanted to share with you here was um, um, this study on findability um, and um, it's out of um, Kent State, I believe. And this study, I, I'll, I'm just gonna mention it here, but what was really powerful for me about this was this notion of findability. And it's not just nice to be able to easily find things in an online course. It has an impact on um, student motivation, uh, their sense of self-efficacy, which means their ability to believe that they can succeed and their perceptions about the quality of the, of the online course. And what blew my mind when I read this paper, and I actually saw them present on it a couple of times, was they not only negatively perceive the course if they can't find something, but they negatively perceive 
see the qualifications of the instructor to teach the course if they can't find something easily. It totally blew my mind when I saw that. And so it's not just nice to have um, in terms of find, being able to find things and being able to have your expectations explicit and clear. It's really, really essential. Um, to help students um, uh, with their motivation, with their belief in themselves that they can succeed and with their perceptions of quality around the, the course and the instructor. Uh, so I'll invite you to take a look at that at some point if you're interested. Um, also in the course overview and information section, I wanted to chat about um, standard sorry, number nine, which is about objectives and outcomes being clearly defined and measurable. And I have a number of resources that I've identified if this is something that you feel in your own self-assessment that you'd like to improve and to think about, I'd like you to consider um, some of these resources and, and to help make this a little bit easier. The, the, when I work with faculty, one of the common um, challenges that I have uh, encountered, and I think any instructional designer will have also seen this, is that faculty um, are passionate about their disciplines and know a lot about their course uh, subject matter. And their impulse is to put everything that they know in the course, essentially making it like a course and a half. And so how do you know what is enough to have in, a, in an online course in terms of workload from the student perspective. So I've put together some um, good information to help guide you and you can also work with your instructional designer if you have one to help you figure this out. But for a 15 week three credit course, it's about nine um, uh, hours per week of work. Um, and so you the way that you can sort of get a sense of what you currently have uh, in your course. There's this amazing um, interactive tool that was designed by, um, um, who are they now? Uh, Wake Forest University. Um, and it's like a, it's a, it's not like, it's, it is a workload estimator. So you can come in here and put in the number of weeks, um, how much reading they're expected to do, details about the reading, what the purpose is of the reading. Um, you know, in this case, it's to engage, how many written assignments, what's the density of the page, what's the genre, um, is, is um, extensive drafting required or no drafting or minimal drafting. You, so you put in specifics about, about your course and then it gives you um, a total number of hours per week um, uh, and, and it gives you, it gives you, it can give, it can help give you a sense of what the workload estimates are. <clears throat> and then and you can come over here and check and see how you're, um, how that, that's mapping to the type of course that you, that you have. And in that generator, what's cool is, you know, as you, as you, manipulate the the elements it's actually a generator you can see this number is changing depending on what i do with this hours per week um and so you can come in and and modify this um to help you get closer to an understanding of whether or not your expectations of what the students are doing are in line with you know something that's physically possible if you come here and see that it's it's taking them you know what amounts to 24 hours a day to complete your course, then you know you need to do some modifications of the course uh, in order to get that down to a realistic um, workload amount. So um, that's just an extreme example, um, but I'm hoping that this is helpful to help you determine what to have in your course and and um, and how to how to estimate that workload issue. Um, then also in this section, I wanted to point out. Um, some information about learning activities and and thinking about how to reconceptualize the design of your learning activities for your online course and thinking about backwards design. So thinking about how you're going to assess whether or not they achieved your learning objective, um, what's the content that maps to that assessment and what's the objective that maps to that um, 
content. So that's backwards design. Um, and if you have access to an instructional designer, I highly, highly recommend that you leverage them to assist you with coming up with, if nothing else, coming up with really good um, learning objectives. And um, I have a few resources here to help you if you want to um, uh, approach this on your own. So this resource, I it's old. It's it's an older resource. I think um, uh, I found it online by this um, instructor, uh, Carl Wenning um, from ISU. But what I liked about it was he talked about how not to write objectives. And then, um, you know, how, there there's some um, comparisons between poor objectives and better objectives. And, and so, you know, if it, writing objectives is, um, it's a skill, I guess, um, and an art. And you want to really put some thought into how you are articulating them and, and so that you can make sure that the content you provide maps to that and the assessments that you provide and the activities that you provide are actually intended, doing what you are intending them to do. So starting with really good, um, well-written learning objectives is a really important part of any um, high quality online uh, course design. So I would, I, I like at this point to introduce you if you're not familiar with um, Bloom's taxonomy, I'd like to introduce you to um, Bloom's and this is, if this page comes up, um, sort of an overview of the um, uh, knowledge dimension and the cognitive um, dimensions of blooms. And it helps to really um, um, understand what you're targeting with your objectives. So if you're doing everything at the remember level, that's a low level course, which is entirely possible. Let me just go up here. <clears throat> Um, the, this is the knowledge dimension, so it might be factual, and you might have them remember some things and and um, have activities for them to interact with things so that they will remember factual information. But as you move, move up Bloom's taxonomy on the knowledge dimension, you go to conceptual understanding, procedural activities, and then metacognition. And then from the cognitive perspective, the 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 ways that they are um, demonstrating this is to remember things, to understand things, to apply, to analyze, and to evaluate. So this model really helps you to target um, and to incrementally, to, to make sure that you're not all at one level, you know, that you're moving learners through blooms in a way that they are increasing their critical thinking and their skills in, um, in these uh, different um, dimensions and, and processes. Uh, so I'll invite you to come back and check this out. I do recommend that you work with an instructional designer to help you um, improve your, um, your objectives. This tool that I'm going to show you now is a tool that you can could use to help you write your objectives and it's from ASU and it's a it's a it's a built it's a objectives builder and basically it will ask you to make certain choices so this is blooms create evaluate analyze apply understand remember so i'm going to hit create <laughs> and then it's going to ask me some questions so it's going to walk you through creating so these are the verbs to use with at the create level of Bloom. So I'm going to say create. And then it's going to ask me some additional questions. By the end of this course, the students will be able to create. And then you, you detail what they're able to create. You can actually type it right in here. And then um, I, I pre-filled this out. So um, the students will be able to create a presentation in the format of your choice, narrative text, creative writing, for example, a poem, a story, um, a song, a script, a drawing, 
um, a video uh, apply the theory of relativity. So that was just one that I came up with, giving learners a lot of choice there and how they make their thinking and learning visible to me and um, using this generator, this objectives generator to help me target the specific level on Bloom's to write the objective. So you can play around um, uh, with this um, as, you, as you like, and then it'll let you at the end, copy it or create a new one. So it's a very handy, cool tool to um, get you started thinking about writing objectives and how to write them targeting specific areas of blooms. Um, so uh, this one is a, a bunch of verbs. So the next set of resources are just around verbs that are associated with blooms and um, and so I just want you to think about, you know, if if all of your objectives say the student will understand or this, you know, understand is not the best verb um, to to use. There are better verbs to to use. Um, so this is a list of, of verbs that are associated with specific um, uh, blooms levels. This is another one for um, people who like owls and color. Um, and if you don't like owls or color, uh, here's a plain text one that can help you all associated with Bloom's levels of, um, uh, of uh, you know, the cognitive dimension and the knowledge dimension. So you can browse those um, for uh, as you're creating your own objectives. Um, okay, so let's now go to the design and layout section of Oscar. And in this um, in this section, I selected standard 16, which is about creating a logical and consistent uncluttered layout for your course, something that's easy to navigate, that's well organized and and that provides uh, that makes use that leverages, titles of things to provide advanced organizers for learners to see something about you, your content, your discipline, the nature of the course from the way that you title things. If you only have things like week one and then, you know, lecture, um, interaction, uh, discussion, uh, a quiz, if that's all that you see module to module, you're missing the opportunity to convey information about your content with the title. So I would encourage you to think about that and to make use of the, the titles to give students advanced organizers um, for the content that you're presenting, the activities that you're asking them to engage in. And that is, um, you know, related to your con to, to, to your actual subject matter. So they get a sense from you of what the discipline is about, what the course is about, how you have approached it from your own disciplinary perspective. It's going to be different for every instructor and uh, how they how they chunk their course, how they dis make decisions about how to present the content and activities. And so really look at leveraging the titles of things for that purpose. Um, so, you know, being consistent um, is really also important so that students don't have, that's an issue of findability again. Um, if, if, if you are consistent from module to module, um, if that makes sense for how you're designing your course, then that's going to make it easier for the learner to understand how the course is organized and what's expected of them from module to module. In some courses, that consistency doesn't make sense. So you have to decide and judge, you know, um, how you want to approach it. But um, in, in general, you know, making sure that you label things consistently, making sure that you you refer to things. If you say, um, go to the ask a question area to ask any questions about this content and um, there's no ask a question area because you've called it um, something else, you know, um, you called it um, talk with your professor, the students are literally going to be looking for something that's called ask a question. So you need to pay attention to that and refer to things consistently so that students can very easily find and navigate to where and what you are asking them uh, to do. The magic number of number of modules is seven 
plus or minus two. So if you have 35 modules that map to 35 units in your textbook, that's too many. And I would highly recommend that you think about the magic number being seven plus or minus two, so not over nine and not under five. And there's reason for that and research behind that. It has to do with cognitive load and you want to chunk materials and content into um, some understandable, you know, comprehensive way. If you want, if you have a lot, like for, if I was working with an instructor that had 35 modules, I would say, let's chunk this into nine. And within each module, you can have, an, uh, you know, a number of sub modules that will allow you to get at your 35. But the, the initial chunking is into, in, into nine, let's say. Um, all right. Uh, let's go to the next one, which is in also in the design and layout area. And in the design and layout area, there's a lot that has to do with accessibility. And I want to mention um, accessibility. There's a number of OSCAR standards that are related to accessibility, which is very important, not just you know, because it's important to make sure that your content is accessible, but also because it, you have to be in compliance with the law. So, um, and the regulations around accessibility. So it's not a nice to have, it's a must have. And one of the things that is really um, uh, important when you're designing your content is to think about whether or not you have to have something in a, a table. And of course, there will be occasions where you need to have things things in a table. But if you do have things in a table, you have to be aware that anyone with a um, with a uh, a reader is going to have trouble with your tables if you don't optimize them for uh, for readers, for screen readers. So um, there's lots of information available um, on the web about it. I pulled one out, um, and this one is from Oregon State University. They do a fabulous job. And here is a table. Um, that you know it would be difficult to present in any other way. Um, and like I said, there's always things that you need to present in a tabular format. But if it's not optimized for accessibility, this is what it's going to sound like for um, for a screen reader. Table with eight columns and five rows, fall term, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior, post, back, non, dash, degree, total, 2007, 42, 40, 32, 18, 34, 18, 46, 39, 344, 369, 162, 28, 2000. It's almost unintelligible. Uh, and what it's doing is reading across the top of the tape. It's just reading from left to right. So it's going fall term, freshman, sophomore, junior, blah, 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 2007. And it, it's just reading straight across, right? If you um, design this with the appropriate accessibility um, headings and, and markers, uh, it will read the table down so that you can, uh, so that whoever is listening to it would be able to understand it better. It's still challenging, obviously, but... Um, understanding table headers and how to optimize um, tables for accessibility is pretty important. And so if you have tables or PDFs or um, any kind of, um, um, you know, uh, thing that's going to need to be um, accessed in, in different ways, like videos that need closed captioning or whatever. I would really highly recommend that you talk with your um, accessibility office or your instructional designers for any supports and resources that they may have to help make sure that any of your content uh, that you are um, relying on uh, is accessible to all. Um, it's really good practice. Um, all right, so that was that. And as I mentioned, there's a lot of um, standards in OSCAR that are associated with accessibility. So um, it's mostly in that design um, um, section of the OSCAR rubric. <laughs> so this section is on content and activities and I selected um, um, 29, uh, OSCAR standard 29 for this, about offering 
offering a variety of engaging resources to present content and support learning and collaboration. And this is really about making sure that you're designing learning activities um, that are active, and not passive, that are interactive. Um, here's where I wanted to show you Topper. Topper is that University of Central Florida resource that um, has peer reviewed, um, high quality, um, uh, very detailed uh, models and suggestions of various types of activities uh, that you can um, adapt for your own um, for your own instruction. I highlighted these. Um, uh, using discussion boards for collaborative learning, um, posting an introduction, video welcome, creating intentional communities through meaningful introductions, <laughs> implementing student video introductions to foster social presence, and asking students to lead online discussions. You can see that there's a ton of, of ideas here. So um, you know, if you're really looking to improve interaction and active learning in your online instruction, this is a wonderful resource to mine for ideas for that. I pulled one out. Um, I One that I love to do myself is asking learners to lead online discussions. And so it gives you um, a, an overview of how this instructor um, accomplishes this with their instructional documents and with um, examples and prompts and so forth and some of the results of that. So if you're interested, all of the resources in Topper are well documented and have been vetted and peer reviewed and selected uh, specifically for inclusion into that pedagogical repository. So I encourage you to take a look and, and, and look through uh, topper for ideas in addition to what you might find um, on the Oscar. So have here for your um, uh, review this um, resource of online in, uh, instructional activities, and this is by um, the University of Illinois. And I love this because it's specific to online instructional activities. And you'll see things here that are analogous to activities in online in face-to-face -face instruction, but these are specifically adapted for the online or synchronous online or asynchronous online environment. So if you would like to do a debate in your online course, your asynchronous online course, or if you would like to um, do an oral report or a jigsaw or an interview or a role play, all of these things are possible in terms of um, um, reconceptualizing those activities activities for an online asynchronous environment or an online synchronous environment. And this resource um, can really help you think about how you might do this. So I just selected debate and it gives you all of the information you need, what the goals are, what the prerequisites are, how you would do the activity. And it gives you specific instructions on, on actually doing it either synchronously or asynchronously, what your strategies might be, what some accommodations might be, the timeline, how you would evaluate it, and some additional resources. So this is a very good um, resource when you're looking for um, things that are analogous to what you do in the, in the classroom and helping you to think about how to reconceptualize them for an online environment. Here's another resource that I call um, 50 Alternatives to Lecture um, that I wrote a long time ago, but that still um, uh, are, is similar. It's like you can do uh, online and in, you can do interviews, you can have guest speakers, you can have student-led discussions, you can have students summarize things, you can do pop quizzes, um, you can, um, you know, do case histories. There, you, there, everything that you are are familiar with doing, you can do. You just have to um, adapt it for the online environment and take into consideration the options and limitations of the environment so that you can reconceptualize it for that environment. Okay. Um, lots of information to, to share with you for you to come back to and, um, and review 
um, when you're actually doing your self-assessment and thinking about how you might um, improve a particular standard and make your instruction, your online instruction, more active, less passive, um, more interactive and engaging and, um, and making students do stuff so that they can make their thinking and learning visible to you and to others in the class for opening themselves up for feedback. All right, so in this one, I wanted to share with you uh, standard 30, which is about the course providing activities for learners to develop higher order uh, at thinking and problem solving skills, such as critical reflection and analysis. And again, this comes back to <laughs> a little bit about what we talked about when we were talking about blooms and um, really thinking about the higher order thinking skills. I really like this graphic um, uh, this 3D graphic of blooms, it really helps you to see, you know, if you're looking at something at the metacognitive level and at the create level, both from the knowledge dimension and the cognitive process dimension, you're looking at having a, a student, um, create an innov innovative learning portfolio of, of materials that demonstrate that they've created things and they've thought about it, reflected about what they know and how they know they know and what helped and hindered their learning and so forth. So, and then you can, you can, you know, go down the list, evaluate and procedural, um, their efficient um, efficiency of sampling techniques, um, analyze and conceptual, that would be differentiate high and low culture. So it, it, it helps you to, to really think about what you're trying to, and, and you can also go like factual all the way up to create um, log of, of daily activities. You're taking um, readings of the, the moon's trajectory or a star system, a, a, a constellation's um, path over the night sky in your particular area, that you're, that's a factual thing and it's at the create level. So, um, so you, um, you can use this to help you to think about what you're targeting in terms of higher order thinking skills, which would be anything in the, you know, sort of analyze, evaluate, create area and conceptual procedural and metacognitive area. Um, so, um, I wanted to share this. This is a new resource that I recently uh, became aware of, and this is from Oregon State. And this is how you can leverage AI levels. And so I'm just sharing this with you to take a look at at, um, at some point. If you're using AI in your instruction, um, this can help you situate those activities on Blooms to help you understand um, you know, where, what you're targeting um, with the different activities and, and how, um, how you're doing that. All right, let's go on to, oh, this is a resource I put together on metacognitive blogging. This is an activity that I do in my own online instruction, and this is how I did it, what I did, why I did it, and what I learned from doing it, and, and what I think, um, you know, students or learners in my class get out of it, and some examples of that. So if you're interested in having students think about, um, you know, what they know, and how they know they know, and what helped or hindered them to learn, this is a great activity. I love my students' blogs. Um, and uh, I get to know them very well through their blog postings and I have them read each other's blog postings also. And so we build community um, around our reflections around knowing and, um, and learning. Um, this just one- Just a quick note for you that there's about eight minutes. Oh, great, okay, I'm almost done. Um, this one here is, if it'll come up, is about standard 38 and standard 38 is the one that's specific to regular and substantive interaction and i do a whole um uh in fact i think we have one planned for this series of oscar webinars there's one just on regular and sub substantive interaction and so I'm showing you the page on, on Os the Oscar website about it. Um, I also wanted to share with you, I have in that um, workshop that or that webinar, I have a, um, a template that I share to help you or your instructional designers or your campus actually document how the different activities in your course are complying with that 
um, regulation. And so if that's something that you're interested in, that workshop is going to be coming up um, uh, at some point during this semester. And then you can obviously you can earn a badge for that w workshop as well. And that's the um, um, RSI uh, uh this one, um, supporting regular and substantive interaction with Oscar webinar. Um, all right, so the ne next one is, um, let's get over there, is in the interaction section and the course offers opportunities for learner to learner interaction uh, and uh, constructive collaboration for all of us social constructivists. And uh, I think this is a very important um, uh, standard. Uh, and if you are attempting um, small group work or cooperative learning, um, there are a lot a lot of ways to go about it and a lot of things that will work and a lot of things that won't work. And so if you're having challenges with your small group and it's not working the way that you uh, would like it to work, then there's a number of resources related to this standard that you can uh, target in your Oscar um, self-assessment and, and review and refresh. And you want to make sure that you're um, you know, designing an activity that um, a, a, a small group activity or a collaborative activity that is going to um, um, function well. And there's a lot of assumptions and a lot of, you know, um, approaches um, that, um, that will, you know, potentially confound students and not result in, in what you're hoping um, to achieve. So, um, so you want to make sure that the students are prepared, that um, you don't waste a lot of time letting students choose their own groups or have a, an activity that helps them do that in an efficient way. Um, making sure that the objective is clear and making sure that they have the necessary skills. And so you might want to start out with a low stakes uh, collaborative activity so that then when they get to something that's more, um, you know, higher stakes that they are able to, they, they have developed those skills um, in order to actually do it. Uh, so there's lots of information um, and, and activities um, that you can design that are collaborative and and, you know, related to, to group work. Um, I found this resource in Inside Higher Ed, which is another one of those resources that shows um, how you can get more active learning into your online class and things like annotation, citation, collaboration that we were just talking about and so forth. And it, this was very simple list of things, but that might be able to get you thinking about different ideas for what you could incorporate into your um, into your instruction or improve in your in your online course. This one, um, uh, Oscar standard. 45 is about using authentic methods of assessment um, to assess your learners. And there's lots of information about authentic online assessment. There's lots of ways to do um, to assess learning well um, in online environments. And um, so the, the resources that I have for you in this section are intended to um, to help you think about, um, you know, how you assess learning. And again, objectives, content, activities, and assessment, that's sort of like the magic formula. And um, in terms of assessment, there's all kinds of ways that you can assess students based on the learning objective, based on the content you've presented, based on the activities they've engaged in, and then based on how you're having them demonstrate that they learned uh, or not. And then um, these are this is just another list of alternatives to assessment. The, the, um, I have so many resources here for you. Rubrics. This one I like because it's got the top five rubrics: online discussion, e-portfolio, video project, uh, and so forth. Discussion. Um, so there's there's models here for you to take a look at to adapt for your own instruction. Here's another one. Um, I love the examples in this one. So disciplinary examples, um, all kind of blog, uh, evaluating blogs, projects, discussion boards. 
couple of presentations and teamwork, critical thinking. So these are all examples of rubrics that you can look at and modify for your own purposes. Um, supporting academic honesty is an important part of assessment. And so you wanna make sure that you're designing your activities in ways that support academic honesty. Um, lots of information about this. And here's some um, 14 ways to support um, academic honesty. Um, and so I'll leave this here for you to check out if that's a concern of yours, if you're worried about that, if you have a midterm and a final and you're seeing issues with that, um, well, talk to your instructional designer. That would help first. And then also um, look at some of these resources if you want to work on it um, independently, um, uh, you know, in advance uh, of working with anyone on it. Um, so I do a whole session on supporting online learner success and what online faculty can do to support online success. So I'm just going to leave this resource here to show you that it's related to self-regulated learning strategies in theory. And um, for um, this is true of face-to-face -face instruction as well as online instruction. And then down here, you'll be able to actually look at all of the indicators um, and, and what an instructor can do to support that, what a successful online student does and what an instructor can do to support um, their development of these uh, self-regulated learning um, skills. Um, and then finally, I think I'm close to the end here. The last one is, uh, yep, and the last one is about opportunities for learners to provide descriptive feedback. So one of the ways that I do it is I have a Padlet that I put up at the end of the course and I have have my current students give feedback for my future students um, on how to, you know, manage the course. And um, and so every student that I've ever had has written um, some um, feedback and then the future students get to see that as well. I, I have here um, the template that I talked about earlier that we designed in Brightspace um, for asynchronous online courses and, and um, to provide um, some feet course feedback at, at the midterm. So a simple question, like what's one thing you would change about this course that would help you learn better? That, that's it, that's at midterm, ask that question and then take one of the suggestions and implement it, just one of them and make sure that the students know that you got the idea from them. Um, and of co course, you're not gonna like redesign your entire course. You pick and choose what you are able to manage, but it shows them that you care about their learning and and are willing to make modifications. And then another um, uh, thing at the end of the course, you can um, ask them for descriptive feedback. So it's not a course evaluation, but really asking them about their experience in your course and about what it is that you could learn from them about how to improve the course. And then you can use that also as part of your um, as part of your re review and refresh process. So that's it. I and it's 1:30, and I'm hoping that. Um, uh, you know, that you'll be able to use any of these. Um, uh, I feel like you're now prepared. We've gone through every section of Oscar, you know where to find things and, um, and you'll be able to take the rubric, whichever version of the rubric you want and be able to start going through it and thinking about your own instruction and self-assessing about how you might be able to improve a particular area in your course. And then um, obviously after the review, you'll have have to do the actual um, improvements in your course. Um, any questions that I can address uh, quickly, Erin? Um, there was one question that came up that I'll ask you in just a moment, but I wanna make sure everybody is aware for those that have to leave that um, I put in the links to the documentation that Alex was sharing. We will um, send the recording well, we'll post it on our YouTube channel, but we will also send that recording along with the links to the resources to those who attended today. Um, we have all of the emails from your registration, so we'll do that. And um, that was the other question that was asked. Um, so Alex, the one question that came up and the person who asked has already left, but in case anybody else experienced this, when they were, um, they downloaded the Oscar 4.0 PDF and um, when they checked a box, they were unable to uncheck it. So let's say they checked a box by accident. They they couldn't uncheck it. And so that's that the PDF. I tested that in the PDF myself, and I was 
I wasn't able to do any sort of undo or uncheck. So that might be something to look at. It's weird. Uh, yeah. Do that. Oh, all right. All right. Well, we'll take a look at that. Yeah, I, it's something I, for us to I've take back and look that. at. I just right. want to make sure if somebody makes a mistake and checks the wrong thing that they can get in there. That's so strange, but okay. Um, so for anyone that um, um wants to stay and ask a question, well, we can like in this. Oh, go Aaron, ahead. in this. Yep. Is this the one? Like I can change it. No yeah. Problem. In the in the one you so can download, weird. it's radio buttons that you can't uncheck. Once it's downloaded, it's, yeah. It's right. not the, the check boxes like I'm seeing on the screen. Okay, I'll take a look. Yeah, thanks, Tabby. And I wonder, yeah. So I'll download this and check it out. Yeah, so right here in your browser, it seems to work okay. But then um, if you downloaded it and we're doing it in Adobe. It was... okay. All right, yeah, I've never heard of that before, but I'll check it out. Are there any other questions? And Was feel free to go if people have to go, that's totally fine. But we'll stay for the recording purposes if there are other questions. I mentioned about the um, um, badges. So everyone who was in this uh, webinar will earn this badge, the Oscar self-assessment badge. And all you have to do to earn this badge is attend the webinar, right? Yeah. Complete. We'll send that out. And then um, if, if you're interested in certification, you can earn this badge. And what you have to do to earn this badge is um, provide some evidence that you completed the entire process of not just reviewing um, your course. So, you know, taking the workshop and completing the review, but then also, um, um, I clicked on something. Um, but also um, providing the evidence. And this is the evidence, you, you know, you have to submit your completed self-assessment, your action plan, your one page reflection. Um, and um, yeah, I guess that's that's basically it. If you have any questions about the certification, don't hesitate to let me know. I'd be happy to work with you um, to try and, and figure out a plan um, to get you certified, um, you know, uh, that's what our goal is, is to help people get the badge if they want it. <laughs> and I know that many SUNY instructional designers, as well as many um, instructional designers beyond SUNY, um, qualify for some of these badges. And so I'd love to give them to you. So let me know um, if you um, if you if you are interested in that and I'll work with you to uh, to help you get that. It's flexible in many ways. So I'm, I want to work with you to get you there if that's what you're interested in. All right. Nicole, Anything which certification did you sign up for? I think it was the first one, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it was okay. the first one. Thank you. Yeah. So, um, so Alex, Nicole could go right ahead, right, with the do a self-assessment course review at this point after attending today. Yeah, yeah. If yeah. you, um, you know, um, go in and and if you've done you done you did the workshop, so you'll get that um, um, piece of the evidence, right? So when I go in to um, make sure that somebody qualifies for the um, for the credential, I check to make sure that you've taken the workshop. I check to make sure that you um, then submit the the evidence and the evidence is do the self. So I need to see a copy of your self-assessment and your um, action plan. And then okay. I need to see a reflection. Um, so 250 to 500 words on the Oscar refresh process, including what you improved as part of the process, what you learned along the way. And, um, you know, you can do this independently or you could do it in collaboration with an instruction designer, whatever works for you. And if you have any questions about it, contact me and I'll help you. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Thank you, everybody, for um, for joining. Our next session is going to be the reviewer, the Oscar reviewer session. Is that right, Erin? That's right. And it uh, is. if you are um, in, 
mm-hmm. interested in Oscar reviewer certification, which means you're certified to review other people's courses, then you can take that webinar and then you'll have to demonstrate um, um, evidence of, of uh, having completed, uh, I think it's five Oscar um, review and refreshes and provide that evidence and you can get that certification. So, and then we're doing regular and substantive interaction next and then designing an Oscar implementation plan. And um, you may or may not be interested in the RSI if you're faculty um, um, or the implementation plan that's more at the institutional level. Um, but I invite you to come uh, to any of them. They're all fun and good. <laughs> I, I, and um, I love to give out badges. So if you just come, you get the, the, one of those nice badges. So thank you, everyone.